Welcome to the latest episode of Platform. I know it's been a while, it's been a while. but I was busy and things came up and just didn't have time to do podcasts. But I'm back. Don't call it a comeback. And to mark the return, I have got a guest that is pretty unusual for this podcast because he is not a quote unquote aggressive blader or he used to be, but he is more interested in freestyle these days. And his name is Nicholas Swan. Nicholas has just opened a skate shop called Beehive Skate Shop and it's in, I want to say it's in Utah and it's only opened as recently as within like the last month or two. However, previous to that, he was sponsored by Rollerblade and featured in a bunch of their videos like the In Motion series that was filmed by Mike Torres and featured Sean Keen. They went to New York, New Orleans and San Francisco, I think it was. However, previous to that, he had a bunch of aggro sections, which were absolutely amazing. And after leaving Rollerblade, he recently joined Micro, um, which wasn't that long ago. He's not been on the team that long. So it'll be interesting to hear, you know, how things went with Rollerblade, why he decided to skate for Micro, you know, what prompted that decision and what he's been up to lately. And obviously the exciting things happening with the shop. So lots to talk about. Before that, though, cue the music. Hey. That's that could be like the most seamless Zoom call I've ever experienced. More like nine times out of ten, people are like, "Yeah, the link's not working, or I can't get in, or nothing's happening." So that was it's, it's happening. Refreshingly easy. Um, so it's it's morning time there. So you're just you're just start. Oh, well, it's like afternoon, isn't it? It's like one o'clock. Yeah, just right? a, yeah, it's one o'clock. Yeah, so not so, not too early, you know. Is this is this you currently in the skate shop? Because I'm seeing a lot of paraphernalia. Yeah, this is our little storefront. Uh, it's just a tiny room, and then it's just attached to our warehouse. Right. Okay. So is it a is it a walk in shop? Yeah, we have a little storefront, just like figure for locals. They can come and get what they need if they if we have it, you know. But right. But it's pretty small. You, like five people would be pretty tight in here, probably. Okay. Right. Okay. That's kind of like, uh, that was like the old, this is soul skate shop in Amsterdam. Cause I, I went there and I walked in and I was like, wow, this is tiny, but they're obviously yeah. doing good. And now they've got a second shop that I right. think is quite a bit bigger. Um, so you telling me that at some point someone could just walk in and be like, Hey man, I've busted my laces or I need some bearings or something. You're going to be like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Currently. <laughs> no, I got the, there's like a little thing on the wind on the door. I put recording a podcast. So, but yeah, they can come in whenever. If, and Duran works in the warehouse pretty much full time doing fulfillment stuff. So he's my partner in the business. So Duran, what's the second name? Duran Bickmore. That's, yeah, right. Okay. I recognized, I, I thought it was like Duran Bick. Where's the, why is that name familiar? Because he's amazing. He's so good at skating. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's footage I'm remembering from. Okay, right, that makes sense. Yeah, and we um, skate together all the time, and he he's just a really great dude. So yeah, we started this together. Just only it's been like maybe a month. Okay. So. Yeah, because I saw the I remember seeing like the Instagram post with the the t-shirts. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a shop is it's not an enviable task, and <laughs> I know many people who have started shops over the years. Um, what inspired you to start what is potentially like the hardest business venture in bleeding? <laughs> um, I think it's just the lack of, we've had two in Utah that, that I've been a part of, not as a business owner, but just that I've seen come and go okay. in, in about 15 years or so. And uh, we had a recent one close that wasn't run by kind of any of the friends that we have, but uh he kind of closed during the pandemic and I'm not sure how that happened. So that sort of sparked the interest because he, he provided like some wheels and bearings for people, but he was kind of focused on speed and 
uh, slalom and some ice skating stuff. And so when that, when the storefront that he had closed down, Duran and I were just like, Duran was basically like, I need a warehouse for my other business. And we were like, let's just find a warehouse that has a little storefront. We can do both. So we, yeah, we became partners and said, let's go for it. And I also have a lot of support from people like Lino and uh, there's a guy in Denver that runs uh, Death and Glory Skate Shop. That's a really successful skate shop. And so I've kind of worked with them on just ideas and how to kind of go about it and make it ideally a smooth process. You know? Right. Okay. Um, what's, what's the other business that Duran runs? He does. Um, well, he's got a few, but he started with a skimboarding business and, and uh, he's currently, that's like on pause because they're doing some injection molding stuff for that business. So that's all like being made in the forms and everything's being happening there. But he started a fulfillment company too. So he's doing some distribution of some products out of the warehouse. So it's kind of an easy excuse to have, we have enough room for skate product and then the other business going on. So skimboarding as in like run it, like those tiny boards that you run onto in the beach. Yeah. But it's more like trick skimboarding. So they, they do like spins onto boxes that are in the water and stuff, you know? Right. So like a cross between wakeboarding and skateboarding or surfing or yeah. something. Yeah. Right. But okay. yeah, but you run, yeah, you're not pulled by anything. So he, he grew up in uh St. George, Utah. And that's like the heavy desert. I'm in a desert too in Salt Lake city, but that's like red rock desert hot pretty much most of the year. And so yeah, years back he started a skimboarding business cause that's, they just always want to be around the water. So I think that went like fairly, Really well and he's still running it i think it's been quite a few years so yeah that's what i was going to ask how big is skimboarding in utah <laughs> it's apparently i think he told me it's like the biggest in poland but <laughs> but in but in <laughs> but in saint george i think it's like fairly popular he they had a little storefront there and he said people would walk in and buy skimboards so apparently it's desirable he says it's kind of a younger crowds thing though so probably why right. we haven't heard of it so what you're telling me is I need to jump ship off this aggressive rollerblading crap and I need to get myself into the skimboarding business. Oh yeah. That's where I've been going wrong. Right. (laughs) Noted. This is the last podcast. I'm done with this. (laughs) Um, So, so it's just you two guys running the shop. Yep. Um, Where did the name come from? So uh, Beehive is kind of a common name in Utah where the Beehive state. Right. Um, And it kind of just started from when they founded the, state the idea was just that it takes everyone together to kind of turn this desert into a livable area okay so the same idea kind of comes with the skate shop is like let's build a community in our eyes so it's and it's so common that like people locally would are turned they're they're fine with it you know they're they're used to it there's other companies with similar names but so it's not so out there but probably from other places it's a little different Right. So you guys have been open for, you said, what, just over a month? Maybe just a month. Yeah, probably a month. How's it, how's it been going so far? Slow and steady, I'd say. A lot of the, we mostly have an aggressive community here in Salt Lake City. So they've been amazing and supportive and everyone's super excited. Um, so, it's, you know, sales wise, it's going and it's, it's slow and growing, but uh we're working with a lot of locals for derby stuff, the roller skate community we're trying to be a part of, just trying to kind of like cross pollinate every aspect of rolling. Like, I think that Denver showed me a lot. There's a community down there called Dust. I don't know if you've heard of Dust. It's like a urban skate group. Okay. And it's kind of, it's run by some really great people, but it's also, uh, I think truly like, the heart of the community in Denver and, and why it keeps growing. And I think the skate park being there or the skate shop being there, death and glory and them kind of allowing like the meetups to start there. And then they do city skates and stuff for, I would say for, there's probably only a couple of states in America that group skates are really large. And, and when I went to this, it was about 80 people showed up and that's super rare for, 
probably anywhere other than like New York or California, I would assume. So yeah. I think, I think that going there and experiencing that was truly like really opened my eyes and just like, and there wasn't just inline, there was roller skaters and there was slalom people and people just like all hanging out doing all like motivated in the same for the same reason, but like with a different thing under their feet, right? And so I think locally I mean, we're trying how, to do, how do much, a similar. How vibe. much different is it really? Let's be honest. I mean, quads and roller blades. You know, I mean, potato, I mostly potato, mean like if like, you're doing like an aggressive approach, right? It's like if you're jumping off stuff. Some people are like, I don't want to jump off anything because a lot of those people down there, they just want to do distance, right? They just want to go and go yeah. forever, and that's not my thing. And that's probably, I would assume, not really yours. I think it's like the trick aspect of stuff is a little bit funner and, and that's personal. But I think when, you know, I hear locals who we try to meet up with, sometimes they go like, Oh, it's kind of intimidating or, you know, and it's like, but it doesn't need to be intimidating where we don't mind if you don't jump off something. And, <laughs> and if you want to just go farther, we'll go with you. So yeah. I think, I think uh, trying to build that community locally will be important for not just the shop, but just for everyone who wants to be skating in the state, I think, and, and trying to be a part of like any part of it. Like if it's Derby, I'm like, Duran and I are going to go to a Derby event soon. They're like, we're going to comp you tickets come. And so we're super excited to go experience that because I've never been to one in my life. So it'll be exciting yeah. to see where that goes. So. Yeah. It's basically roller derby is quite funny. It basically, it, have you ever seen the film uh, Rollerball? with i've seen like parts of it yeah i know what it is yeah well yeah they had a remake which was yeah i haven't, I haven't watched that but the original was uh yeah it's basically it is just like that on roller skates it's it's it was surprisingly brutal when because there's like there's quite a big scene for it here and yeah. um like a friend of mine does it and i was just like the, the kind of injuries they come back with it's like you know cats and britain it's, it's basically like they've been playing i don't know like rugby or something like full contact yeah, right. sport they right. properly <laughs> just smash into each other and you're like man if you guys can do that you should get into aggressive skating because you get you get yeah. just as beat up so right. you know i do yeah. think that there's some of the um derby people i've heard that do kind of park skating too and so i think it does kind of blend into both so there's there's a definite but, crossover yeah. yeah um it's funny you mentioned that like i've always thought that because especially rollerblading in the mid 2000s was definitely inaccessible and definitely in intimidating because everyone all the videos were just people jumping off roofs and doing the biggest mm -hmm. rails they could find the most terrifying yeah. so of course you know we were alienating ourselves from everyone because people would see that and they go well that's not that's not achievable. <laughs> like, well, and they're just like, I, I don't relate to like wanting to jump off of anything, let alone like that building. And yeah. So <laughs> like it, it reminded me of watching Ness. Like I remember watching like Ness and ESA competitions in the nineties and I'd watch the street and go, Oh, that looks awesome. That looks fun. Like I want to do what Randy Spicer is doing. I want to do yeah. what champion bomb similar is doing. And then I'd see Renee Hallgren on vert or like Sesamora yeah. doing a backflip like 12 foot out the top of the Copen. And I was yeah. like, those guys are psychopaths. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing <laughs> yeah, that. Like 0% do I want to like, do that? I don't yeah. want to die. Like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's where like, that's what I like about kind of this new trend towards urban skating is that it's just really accessible for people and they see it and they go, that looks fun. It's just flowing through a city or it's just flowing through an environment or like but it's more stable you know it's more grounded and that's yeah and that looks like achievable i guess yeah it's like the it's it's like i don't know the, either the missing link or the segue between aggressive and recreational because one of the main things that especially when i have to speak to people who don't skate they're like well recreational skating just looks a bit lame like it's just people and because on a skateboard you don't need a high level of ability to look kind of cool on a skateboard, but like you can just hop on and off it whenever you want. The same with a BMX, like you can just kind of cruise sitting on it and look like you know what you're doing, whereas you have to have a relatively high level of skill in order to look comfortable on skates. Like Because yeah. if you don't, you kind of look like Bambi on ice, and it, it, like yeah. I can understand why that's not appealing, whereas aggressive can look, yeah, just intense and a little bit too much. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who just don't have that mindset and aren't willing to hurt themselves for anything. And I feel like, you know, free skating or whatever you want to call it, urban skating has got that kind of, it's got the elements 
of rec, like, you know, just getting from A to B, getting doing what you want, but at the same time, kind of putting a little bit of flair into it and, you know, utilizing obstacles along the way and, and mm-hmm. showing that you are, you know, competent or above level in, in skating. So, yeah. yeah. yeah um, so what kind of hurdles have you experienced so far with the shop? Has there been anything that, you know, came out of left field that you were like, oh, didn't see that coming or, or, or this is, this aspect's harder um, than I expected it to be? Actually, nothing yet. Everything's pretty smooth. I think maybe it comes from Durant's past involvement with warehousing and he, he had a warehouse in St. George. And so maybe that helped us with having a physical space. But as far as just the shop goes, besides having probably the hardest thing is just getting contracts because there's not a lot of product. So some companies are just like, we're not giving out new contracts to like shop because we don't have inventory for you. Right. So besides, besides that, you know, and it's been a little tough in terms of like even locals being like, Oh, carry this product, this product. And we're just like, we can't like, we're not even allowed to because they're just like, we don't have products for six months or a year or whatever it is. So besides yeah. that, you know, like the companies that we are involved in and, and the companies who are coming soon, it's been really smooth and really easy. And I think, yeah, nothing yet. Let's cross my fingers. I hope it stays that way. That's what I was going to say, because obviously as a new shop, you're like an unknown entity, but you obviously right. have connections in the blading world from, you know, being a sponsored skater and having skated for a considerable amount of time. I was wondering like how difficult companies find that to, you know, agree to, yeah, like you said, do contracts with you because they're like, well, we don't know if you're going to be around in six months or if you guys are serious or, you know, if, if this yeah. is like a legitimate business. So is, is it tough to convince companies to be like, hey, like let, like, let us set up orders with you? I think, um, yes and no. I think that it does help that I have a little bit of history in skating and, and I can, and I can, you know, in, in an email or a call to somebody, I can say it's, it's my 21st year, I think, skating and and that I think that probably sounds appealing to a company and they go, okay, he must be in it. And then if I say, Oh, I also currently ride for companies and I, and I still travel and skate, like I'm very involved. I do think that's appealing and that maybe that helps in some ways. I don't think it's the end all. I think even down to, you know, communication skills in an email or in a phone call, I think is important and probably helps a company be like, I do want to work with these guys because they're professional or they know what they're talking about or whatever it is. I think uh, convincing, I think the hardest part with convincing has been like the storefront part. Some companies are like, we want to see the storefront before we'll finish the application basically. And it makes sense. They want to make sure that maybe they want to make sure it's not in a garage or in a trunk of a car, or maybe they want to make sure it's their product will look appealing in that space. And that's kind of like, our space doesn't look like much, but what we're going for is basically just like bright and simple so that anyone who walks in could maybe be relatable to it. Like it's not a, it's not heavy in any direction. It's just simple and clean. And yeah. And I think, I think that's probably helpful in, in terms of getting new contracts in. Um, plus, you know, Bladen's like everything else. It's a big boys club and it is who you know. And the more kind of, yeah, the more contacts you've got within it is going to make it easier to navigate, especially at the beginning before people become familiar with you guys as a new retail outlet or whatever. Um, yeah. Don't you have a background in photography or design or something? Cause I remember watching a rollerblade video with you and it shows you going into the office and doing, I think it was some kind of like in, interior photography or something like that. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So that's my full-time job for seven years now. I've done architectural photography. So right. I do have a background in it and I still shoot full time and I shoot film and stuff. So it's kind of been my, since I was young, super young, I've always done photography. Yeah. Cameron Card actually is the one that sort of taught me that in layman's terms, the in, in, ins and outs of a manual camera, uh, digital camera before that I had shot film, but yeah, Cameron was the one that really sat me down and was like, here's what stuff does. And I was like, Oh, cool. Nice. Now I can do this forever, I guess. So, small world he doesn't still live there does does he not live in the he east coast now he does yeah he lives in pennsylvania but yeah he lived here we were really good friends for years and years and years before he took off right um so that must come in handy like the photography background for the shop because it means that you know i'm, I'm guessing Duran's like well you're in charge of promotional material yeah yeah 
I, I kind of focus on, yeah, all promotion stuff, a lot of the contacts and relationships with companies and um, like I'm filming some stuff with micro right now with some models, um, which can also be utilized as a shop as, you know, since I'm filming it. So I think that it's definitely useful for sure for us to, and Duran also has a background in some of this stuff, he, having his other companies, he's, he's definitely not bad at it, but I think that's probably more my focus in the business. Yeah. Okay. Who's Micah? Uh, micro. Micro. Right. So I was yeah, like, sorry. I was like, I haven't, what are we talking about here? Got you. Micro. Um, so are you still, are you still working your day job and doing this on the side or is, or have you jumped both feet into this venture? Yeah, I do. I do still full-time photos and then pretty much I just blend it all together after work. I'm here a lot till like 9 PM or 10 PM or something. Right. Okay. But I have a very supportive family. My wife and daughter are fairly used to me traveling a lot with, with photography. I travel a lot for photos. So they're kind of like, we get it. You got to get this thing going. So hopefully in time I can back off a little bit and like make it more of a nine to five situation, but and anything starting out, you gotta get busy. Okay, I was foolishly under the impression that you were either single or did not have children because this it's a mammoth task for anyone to take on, but you're telling me you're taking this on with a family in tow. That's you're a brave man. Okay. <laughs> Wife and a ten year old daughter, yeah. Oh, oh well, you know, ten ten's pretty much self sufficient. <laughs> yeah. If if I tried to do something like that now with a, with my five year old daughter, yeah, my partner would look at me like get upstairs and behave yourself yeah. well, she's been super supportive for everything so I, I i think i could have done this when she was five and she would have been all about it so right so what you need to do is convince her to go into her school and get all her friends to come to the shop and buy stuff oh, yes. they, well, i'll be a part of that skates. for sure they need next skates. year we'll when we have more inventory and stuff i definitely plan to go to the school a lot be like you know what y'all need yeah any of my stuff <laughs> So you mentioned you mentioned Lino and the shop in Denver, and they've been kind of helping you like navigate through the teething process to starting a shop. What kind of what kind of advice of or you know information have they given you that's been invaluable? And you're like, oh, like you know, I'm I think, fortunate. Uh, probably one of the major things is um, kind of not carrying just anything and really focusing on products that you care about and that you believe in and that, you know, you got to find a balance. Your locals are going to want stuff that maybe you're like, I don't really like that brand that much or whatever, but I think a focus on uh, just carrying things that you believe in and really pushing that one item or that one brand or whatever it is, I think is a, I think that's important information. I think uh, Lino is really good at that with his products and, I think he's really successful with Wheel Addict because he really cares about these few items and he tells everyone about it every day, all the time. Yeah. And so, uh, and then Jesse at uh, Death and Glory, he's, he's sort of helped me understand some of the, more like the roller skate side of stuff where I'm not so familiar and kind of how to navigate what they like to see or this type of thing. So he's been good with that. Okay. Um, plus that's pretty crazy that you were saying yeah that that shop in Denver's basically got a city skate that has like what did you say over 80 people showing up to it because if you've got that and the base of it is the shop or it starts off at the shop or it's connected to the shop in some way that's that's essentially 80 potential loyal customers and 80 potential loyal customers could keep a shop in business I think uh I think when I went, it was 80 people came, 70 or 80 people. And it's not run by the shop, but he's obviously a part of it. Um, I know that Rachel, I forget her last name. She, she sort of, I think, is the head person. And she has a help, uh, someone that helps with it. But they have multiple meetups a month. They have different skill levels. And one, the one that I went to is the city skate. And so they met up at the shop. And people are all about that shop. They're all about Jesse. He's, a, he's an awesome guy. And he's told me that pretty much like 80 to 90% of his business is local. So it's, it's obviously that 80, those 80 people probably are very like often participating in the shop. But I also, I assume just like Salt Lake, there's, 
you know, you go to the lo local park and there's probably 40 people I see over a month span of new people, new faces I've never seen before. And I'll, maybe I'll never see them again, but obviously people are buying skates too, who aren't coming to those meetups or that who are just doing their own thing somewhere else. So it's pretty amazing that locally he's, you know, he's gotten help establishing this community, but I think that that being the heart of it is really important that I really want to replicate that type of feeling here. It was really amazing to, to experience because I have, it was the first time in, like I said, 20 years of going to a group, any sort of group meetup that wasn't a contest and it wasn't, it was just a weekly random thing and to have so many faces just so stoked on it was so cool. So nice. I'll definitely be making myself back out. Like I'll be getting out there soon to go to another one for sure. So yeah, my knowledge of the Utah seems pretty limited. I've seen the, I saw the VOD those guys made during the, like, I don't know what you want to call it. Yeah, lockdown or pandemic or whatever that had Matt Moya and Hazen. Is it Bell or Ball? I can never. Yeah. Hazen Bell. Bell. Yeah. Hazen Bell. Yeah, the the big guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but beyond that, is there? Yeah, is there a big scene in Utah, like in terms of I don't know, rec and rec and agro it's, and free skating and stuff like that. Yeah, it's certainly not as big as it was when I first came to Utah. Um, like when Cameron Card and Tori and uh, George Vesey and Chris Olpin and these guys were all like kind of the, the ones cause they were like the pros or whatever. Yeah. But, but when we would have Thursday night skates with those guys around, I mean, sometimes there would be like 40 people come or 50 people and all aggressive, but I would say now there's, I, I definitely think there's a scene. I wouldn't know how to put a number on it. Maybe 50 people who are like super involved. Maybe they don't come to every meetup or whatever, but, but pretty much any day I could definitely contact a lot of people and have a little group skate like in town for sure people are very committed and people like Hazen like you mentioned like he's all in he's completely motivated right now and skating amazing jet runner is like kind of every Utah's favorite dude and he's like a little unknown and just like the most incredible guy so him and Hazen are just like so motivated right now and I don't know you know where that's coming from in a way because i don't know how much is happening i know they're filming on projects and stuff but they're just stoked on skating still and i i love to be around it for sure so yeah he, he's in bell's got that like big guy like derek henderson kind of vibe where it's like he's got yeah. kids and you know he should be too busy for this yet he's skating yeah. at an incredibly high level and you're like yeah how is how is he managing that <laughs> yeah Hazen's Hazen's pretty unreal because it's not only that he also where his full-time job is window cleaning, like huge, you know, 30 story office buildings and stuff. So that's super laborious. Yeah. And then all <laughs> the time on, on his social media, it's like, if I wake up and you know, it's like six 30 in the morning or something, if I see his story, he's like up a mountain hiking. And then later that night we'll be skating. It's just like, that guy just doesn't stop. He's, he's all go. And it's funny too, cause he's kind of like Derek. I think they're both kind of like teddy bears. Yeah, they're behind big the dudes. Scenes, you know what I mean? Big yeah, dudes, but, yeah. But like really kind. He's like one of the nicest people I've, I know. So even though he's big, he's got this gnarly beard and whatever, he's just the nicest guy ever. So Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so have you got like any plans for the shop in terms of initiatives or like, you know, um, I don't know, just ways to kind of grow it or create a scene around the shop in order to, you know, make it sustainable? Yeah, we have uh, a lot of ideas that include the roller skating community, the uh, derby community, and the aggressive community. And I'm hoping the aggressive community will help uh, kind of push the urban community. Because I think uh, there is a lot of attraction to urban skating in Utah, but I think um, the intimidation thing is something for, for locals who are not really aware of yet. So I want to try to kind of get all these things going around the same time but it's tough with the weather like we're coming in the winter now we have obviously lots of snow and stuff in utah um i think in the winter a lot of the push will be sort of a focus on maybe jam skating indoor roller skating or derby skating because that's still happening that's what i was winter. gonna ask do you guys have like roller rinks and stuff like that there because oh, yeah. that's become yeah. a big thing in the uk where it's like people sure. do it for like stag nights and hen nights and stuff like that and birthday parties so that's, yeah. that's definitely something to capitalize on. Yeah. And, and 
a huge thing too is just participating in their events and their stuff like showing face having products they desire we are going to start manufacturing some of our own products um shop branded stuff and i think that'll kind of drive a lot of local community feeling you know that i can buy my shop's product yeah and um just really trying to get involved in anything they're doing and ideally eventually you know if we have enough product or stock of stuff to take to an event then they don't even have to come to us right like we'll just come to you yeah and i think just just really just participating i think that's our biggest goal right now and we're super interested duran and way interested in like seeing all these things that we've never been a part of we've been so you know super focused on aggressive and urban skating for our whole lives that it's kind of fun to think about going to a derby event i never thought i would really do that but it sounds exciting and you know it's i think it'll and all the people that i've met in the derby leagues are so awesome and i and they're super excited and they're really supportive in what little we can offer them currently they're so supportive so i think it's sort of slowly happening you know the snowball is like small but i think yeah. it'll grow as as time goes and i hope by spring um we'll sort of be a staple in the community and, and be able to go to the local park where people do a lot of fitness and rec skating and and offer them things that you know even testing skates out we plan to have fleets of skates that people can test um try stuff out before they buy it you know we all know how hard that is to just buy something and you're like well that doesn't work at all this is the worst skate i've ever had yeah so it's like yeah to be able to test some things i think you know we have a lot of plans and i think hopefully by spring it's a lot of it's sort of happening so definitely yeah i would definitely say that's one of the biggest kind of barriers or inhibitors with skating because yeah with with a scooter you can just pick up pretty much any scooter and extend it out you know and use it or a skateboard you know if you're just skating at entry level you don't need a high end as long as it's got a board and it's got polyurethane wheels and decent bearing you're all right and the same with a bike as well like but with skates you can put on a pair of skates and they can be crippling on your feet mm-hmm. like they can you can be like i th- these hurt just to wear these these i'm not i've not even stood up yet these hurt yeah so it's it's tough to just, you're wrapping your foot or, you know, you're wrapping something around your foot that's, that's like supposed to be so fitted and perfect, but it's like just a plastic form that has no real shape. It's just sort of a generalization of a foot. And so it's tough yep. to find something that truly works. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can help out with all that. I think that's been our biggest um, comment from anybody, wh- whether it's, roller skate or derby or or inline is people just being like i cannot wait to try skates on i just want to try skates on so hopefully soon we can kind of have a lot to offer them yeah it definitely takes the jeopardy out of making a you know 300 or 400 dollar purchase or whatever yeah because you go well i actually know that this isn't going to cut off the blood to my toes yeah well and and for some of these people even a 120 dollar purchase is great because it's maybe their first pair and they're like yeah i don't even know if i want if i'm gonna like this but the but like if you get the fit right and they're interested enough to buy a skate in the first place, that might be what keeps them in it. Right. But if they're so down, super interested, and then they get a skate and it's, and it feels like crap, they're just like, nah, I don't like skating, but it's like, Oh, it just doesn't fit right. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a lot of balance. That'd be quite interesting if you just applied that to other things. Like, I don't know, you tried on like one pair of running shoes or like basketball shoes or something and they felt a bit weird and you're like, I don't like running shoes. <laughs> you, know, yeah, you, don't, yeah. you don't like all shoes. Right. <laughs> <don't>, yeah, any <laughs> shoe. <laughs> like, I don't know, you put on a dress, you put on like a dress shoe to go to a wedding or something and they pinch a little bit and you're like, dress shoes aren't for me. That's it. I feel, I feel that a little bit with, I feel that a little bit with some aggressive skates because I'm, I'm usually on the wrong size of aggressive shells. And so I'm either too tight or I'm way too loose. And so kind of for me, um, I'm a little bit like that with aggressive skates where I'm kind of like, I just don't like aggressive skates, <laughs> but it's, but it's always just down to fit, you know, like oh, I love yeah. Aeons for maybe a year and then for whatever reason, my feet die in them now and I can't skate them. So 
Yeah. I spent pretty much up until my mid twenties, just always wearing boat skates that I looked down and I was like, I hate the way these things look. They're always just massive and not yeah. as, as clunky to, and then for the past like 10 years, I've just been killing myself, squeezing into skates that I have I no know. business trying to put my, <laughs> cause I'm like, I want them lighter. I want them tighter. I want them to do yeah. exactly what I want them to do. I'm not, yeah. I'm not going up the way I'm going down. Mm-hmm. That's probably the most like common aggressive thing it's just like i just shove them in there yeah pretty much (laughs) well well you know the aftermarket liner companies made a killing out of it because if it wasn't for intuition i would have no hope in hell of fitting into half of these skates for sure so um a long time before starting a shop which is obviously your newest venture and free skating you yeah you obviously come from an aggressive skating background i remember you had a section was that around 2011 what's it called oh the two in it we love to roll maybe is that right we oh was that cameron cart's video was it cameron cart right because i saw eric i saw eric bill and a few of the clips filming fisheye so i I thought it might have been one of his videos yeah it could have been snake river special too no it wasn't you no because in snake river special too you were you were free skating in this one you were definitely doing aggressive because you were grinding a lot of electrical boxes oh yeah 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 that was I think it was We Love to Roll. Yeah, I think that was Cameron yeah. Card. Um, okay. Yeah. That so was that, was, that was a weird transition time because I think it was like when we started playing with different styles of skating or like maybe urban type of stuff that it wasn't so clear what it was. But yeah, those are good times. That's what I was going to ask because there's a few clips in there where you're basically just hopping from obstacle to obstacle and doing it in a line. And back then I would probably have been like, well, that's not a trick. Why have they like, you know, that's they've just filmed a line and all he's done is like hop from, you know, post or like hopped over the stairs, hopped onto a planter. But now you're like, oh, that's, that's actually making interesting use of, because, you know, if there's not a grind option there or there's not a gap option there, it's like thinking outside of that and going, oh, right. So I can basically just use these as platforms to get from the top of it to the bottom of it. Whereas back then, because you're so, yeah. Well, or all skaters were so kind of like trick focused or what's the hardest thing I can do on this obstacle? You, it would be overlooked back then, but I feel like now stuff like that is definitely a lot more appreciated. Yeah. I think just the general open-mindedness in skating sort of allows it to be a trick now or whatever. But yeah, definitely back then I remember like Eric Bill or Cameron Carter, those guys are always supportive of anything, you know, like I've been skating with Eric since pretty much day one. So we've always respected each other's skating and stuff, but definitely I've probably filmed in some States with some people that, you know, you do, you film a line and you're sort of in the middle of it, but you're not getting much back. And so I'm kind of like, does this suck? Or is this like a dumb idea? But, but to me, I'm like, it's fun. Like I want to do this because it seems, it feels fun. But when you don't get any response, when you're trying something, you're kind of like, I need to approach this differently, but yeah, aggressive skating just got kind of, I wouldn't say boring. It was like, I wasn't that great at it. I was really good at a few tricks, but I... I mean, that section was... was I would say it was of a like a good standard. Like, there was there was hard tricks in there. So it wasn't like... Well, I think... I guess I'm comparing it. Like, people I've been around my whole life were just so incredible that you're... I'm always, you know, you're always fighting to get to that level or to these guys, you know... Uh, like how they approach stuff or whatever, and, but within your own kind of world too. But I think that when I was at the time of kind of transitioning full time to urban, it was like, I, you know, if I'm missing a something, I'm not that good at like a Savannah or something. But when I miss it, I'm just like laying on the ground. It was just like, what is this even for? Like what, like the fun is not even here anymore. And so I think it just slowly you know, and I had an injury, a couple of injuries. And my wife is basically like, you got to quit. This is done. you got to be done. But, but when I started full-time kind of just focusing only on urban skating without, it wasn't like a plan. I wasn't like, I'm only going to urban skate, but it was like, I'm just having a lot of fun now. And the fun was lacking and aggressive. Cause I'd probably say I aggressive skated like 15 years, probably 16 years, like all of the time that was my life. That's all we did. That's all we, you know, and I think that much time doing it, when I kind of stopped progressing, it was like, this isn't that fun anymore. So Yeah. 
That's what I was going to ask. So it was around about that time you started gravitating towards free skating. And I was, I was curious, like, was it an injury that led you to it? Or was there other reasons? Because there weren't, at least there weren't as many people transitioning from aggressive to free skating back then. In fact, that that's only been a kind of recent phenomenon in like the last five, eight, maybe not even five years, five or six years. Yeah. 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 The It's kind of funny because like, I don't even remember the like year that it was happening. I just saw recently on my YouTube that there was a, I have a, my very first trick on free skates, they were on Seva FR ones, I think. And it says nine years ago. And I'm like, it doesn't seem like I did that nine years ago, but <laughs> apparently I uploaded that nine years ago, but yeah, it was, a, it was pretty much two injuries. I broke my collarbone and like pretty much a month after I was like fully healed and skating full time again, I had a really bad, I got, hurt with rebar in my knee and it like ripped my knee open uh that's when my wife was basically like you're done like this is stupid and I, and I even was just like what this is so dumb yeah like i'm just getting hurt for no reason we don't have money for this like the you know the typical thoughts when you have a kid and a wife and so oh, i yeah, kind of because around that time and, your kid would have been really if your kid's 10 now around that time yeah they would just yeah. have been born or like in the first year or two so yeah yeah, that's and I think a lot. The, the two injuries, one after another, kind of felt like this is going to be forever. When, like, obviously it isn't going to be forever, but it was just like, why? Oh my God, like, again, is this just going to keep happening, you know? And so I actually was basically like, I'm just done skating. And I was fully just going to quit. And then after like months of trying to heal my knee and, and whatever, uh, you know, I'm like itching to do something. And obviously that something was skating, but I was trying to fulfill the same feeling with other stuff and just trying different hobbies or whatever. But luckily I saw online some type of free skate video. I can't remember. I think also the mushroom blade guys were like jumping around on FRs and stuff. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think at the time from my injury, I had no money for skates. And I think, uh, Kirill who runs, uh, bloom bloom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he like fronted me the money to buy my first pair of FRs and, like kind of helped me out to, I think it was probably pretty clear. I was just like, I'm going to, I got to do something. I got to skate. And so I think he and I've got FRs at the same time. And soon after that, I think Cameron Carter, we just sort of like started messing with it and playing with it. And then just slowly it just turned into like, I don't even, I filmed one section with Eric Bill. Snake River special three, maybe three. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a full aggressive section in it and a full urban section in it. And that was kind of like, personally for me, uh, was like, I just want to do one more, finish it off. And like, I think that might've been Eric Bill's last. I'm sure that was, that's what I was going to say. I'm sure that was one of his last full length videos. Yeah. Yeah. We had one more after that. That was the Morrow Bay with Sean Keen and, uh, Jet Renner and myself and Eric and, um, Casey Bogazzi. Yeah, okay. you should check it out. It's online for free now, but yeah, we went on like a five day trip to Morro Bay and filmed a video. Oh, is this the one just passing through? Is this the one they, they were donating the proceeds to charity or something? I think I do kind of vaguely remember this. No, maybe, selfishly, we were trying maybe to I'm keep the now. money to uh, to do another trip. It was called Just Passing Through, and it was just like this idea of passing through a city for five days and making a video of it and trying to have the funds fund the next trip. And just like recycle the same money right we got one in and eric was like i'm all close <laughs> i just want to do close <laughs> i mean to be fair he's put out a lot of content over the years i mean he was pretty much responsible for 90 percent of eric bailey's sections um even contributing loads of footage to the valo videos and then there was oh, yeah. obviously yeah all his videos that he made like yeah snake river special and then what was oh there's one of the cloud in the name as well i am cloud i was a cloud yeah i was a cloud yeah um so it's not like he's not he's, yeah he's he's put in the work yeah yeah he retired for a good reason he was he was just tired of the whole situation and how you know and probably being that committed and that much time and energy and driving and editing and not to say he didn't get anything out of it but like you know at that point when we've kind of wrapped things up on the ndn and 
that like filming with that crew so much it was kind of just like what is this doing for me and he was really focused on clothes and doing his vintage clothing store and stuff and so it was all natural and smooth and I miss it because we did it our whole lives you know but for obvious reasons it's kind of wrapped up and you know it's always a moment in time that you guys can look back on and you've got the video evidence there so it's like if you ever want to reminisce on it it's 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 a click right away or yeah, yeah so um so your type of like freestyle skating is very much like you can see how much it is influenced by aggressive skating because you do like a lot of gaps a lot of hopping onto obstacles a lot of a lot of stuff that you know, is not a million miles away from quote unquote traditional aggressive skating. In fact, I even saw in some of your videos that you do like Savannah stalls when you're like hopping off obstacles or onto obstacles. So you, you, you know, the, the like stereotypical movements are there. You've just blended it and made it more, I don't know, I don't really know what correct term, fluid or made it more, made it more travel based or getting, yeah, getting from A to B kind of thing. Is yeah. what when you started doing it, was there a, a conscious decision to kind of move as far away from aggro as possible, or were you like, like what was, what did, did you have a specific motivation when you started doing it? No, I think um, that's kind of why I liked it, is because it was just so natural, and like I wouldn't, I would just like, I just felt free all of a sudden. It was just like. I felt, I think maybe I was obviously creating this myself, but with aggressive skating, it was just like, all I could see is the ledge or all I could see is the ledge line or whatever. But for some reason, when like, I just started free skating more and more, it, it just like a whole, it's like everything just expanded and the environment got bigger and, and it would be like, what's it like to roll off that thing? Cause now I have bigger wheels. So like, I love to skate like rocks and stuff because you don't catch on them and you don't, you know, it's like you sort of, not it's not just the environment but like the 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 ground that you're actually rolling on changes too because i skated other than my aeons i was full-time uh anti rocker so so like being able to just go over whatever you want was just so random it was just like oh what the heck let's mess with this but it wasn't very conscious i wasn't really trying to get away from anything i also just think i naturally like like obstacle course type of, I like look at spaces as like an obstacle course and it's yeah. like fun to just play with like a way to navigate through it. It's just like, yeah, it's pretty, I would say it's very natural and I don't think too much about it, but I do like to sit back and like when I get to a spot where it looks really interesting, it's like, where's the funnest part of this spot? Like what's, where's the wall ride? Where's, you know, where's the beginning and the end? It's just, yeah, it's a lot funner. I guess it's more playful now. Skating feels a lot more playful now than before. And maybe, what I tried to steer away from that was conscious was the seriousness of aggressive and how there was a lack of playfulness and maybe in my environment anyways, of like, it was just like, here's my trick and here's my hammer and here's my rail and I'm going to do this gap. And like, it was so serious. And I think that was starting to get overwhelming to me. Even being around it was, was pretty overwhelming. Like I, I, t I take things serious and I probably sometimes get too serious on a trick. But for the most part, it's just like goofing around. It's just fun. I would definitely say there's, yeah, for the longest time there was that take people, skaters taking skating very seriously. But I would say in recent years, again, that's one of those trends that's kind of a refreshing, welcome addition to the sport. Like people very obviously just not caring what it looks like or what other people think of it, just doing things that they get enjoyment out of you know like you mentioned the mushroom blading guys people like danny beer people doing like unorthodox tricks that kind of infuriates certain corners of this book because yeah. they go are they just making fun of what we're doing or like what are right. they doing and it's like well they're clearly just in, like having a good time so yeah. does does it matter what their motivations are yeah i think i feel like the overall trend and like just the current state of just things right now is sort of just playfulness and messing around with stuff. And you see like really wacky clothing trends are happening right now. And, you know, people are, I think in all fashions kind of opening up more to just doing whatever, being whatever it seems like. And, and I'm totally happy for that. And it definitely makes filming with people locally or when I travel to anywhere fun, you know, like even filming with 
Mike Torres and stuff, it's still like, it doesn't feel like it's as serious as probably sometimes it could seem with that type of filmer and that, you know, who's really a part of the core like thing going on in skating, but I had a blast with him and we all, you know, we can still mess around and have a good time. So I think Mike is, but he's also a massive skate nerd that's definitely, you know, obsessive about the whole like Canadian mushroom blading movement yeah, thing because true. he's, yeah, he, he loves the whole like wizard thing and uh, Leon and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's true. I, I, I don't know how core Mike would consider himself. <laughs> I think, I think yeah, he would consider himself true. quite a, a pariah of the, the yeah. core, the core market. Maybe I think of, I'm thinking of when he skates with like the them guys or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I have noticed is you, you don't you don't really tend to do slides very much in your set. Like whenever I've seen sections of you, it is very much about wall rides and like navigating obstacles. In fact, one of the few ones I've I've ever seen you do is the ender in your micro introduction, where you do the full cab like slide. I guess you could call it until like the kind of sloped block or roof yeah. thing or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, are you not a fan of them or or am I just not looking in the right places? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I do slide quite a bit, probably mostly on Instagram or whatever, but I think the main reason is because I just kind of learned them not that long ago. Mike Torres and Sean Keen taught me slides like three years ago. Right. Okay. So <laughs> I just never could do it. And I think we were on one of our trips filming somewhere and they were, they were, they almost like were annoyed that I couldn't do it. Like, just do it you know and so they they coax me into just like practicing and they taught me pretty quick so now i love it i slide a lot i feel like now but um i think sometimes it's like utah's architecture is often like very very flat and so it's fun to slide on flat stuff sometimes i can't slide super long but i like to when i travel i i tend to like to try to find kind of like that bank spot you're talking about in the micro edit, like something to like set slide in or something that's actually a bank or whatever. But yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying to slide more. So what was their, what was their uh, sage wisdom that helped you learn how to do slides? You've got to, you, you've got to impart this and share it to other people. <laughs> I think um, it's kind of similar to if you, if you Google the Lino's how to slide video, he, he teaches it kind of similar to how, they taught me, but I think the bigger reason was that I think they might've been the first people I skated with who knew how to slide. And right. so I could actually like see somebody do it firsthand and see how they're carving into something. Cause I have to do like a big C turn to like get the slide going where some people can just like turn really quick, almost like they're going to shuffle. Yeah. And I can't, I, don't, I still can't do that. So I think it was just mostly, you know, seeing them do it in person and watching it happen. They can kind of replicate that motion. All right, fair enough. But it's not um, a lot of advice, but the best advice is if anyone needs to learn to slide, you just have to go skate with Mike Torres and Sean Keen, and that's that's how you learn. So I either need to go to New York <laughs> or San Francisco. I mean, that's that's, that's yeah. a tall order. That's, that's I, the I only way to learn the Atlantic to, to learn. Yeah. Right. Cool. I might, I might just go to Portugal. It's only a couple hours away. That's that's easier. Yeah, I'll, Lino's got you for sure. Yeah, I'll just hit Lino up and. Well, Lino's how to video is really good on sliding. I've I've watched that after knowing how to slide and it's definitely like the best breakdown in my opinion probably sean and when might teach it well too but it's just like a pretty you just take baby steps into a carve and once the wheels start to break a little bit you just ease it a little more and a little more until you start to realize oh here's the limit you know and then it just goes yeah um so we jumped forward a wee bit when did you end up getting on rollerblade and how did that happen? I fir- well, if I first skated for rollerblade when I was 18 <clears throat> in 2008, I think. I, uh, yeah, cause I, I saw, I remember aggressive clips of you were wearing solos, right? Yeah. 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 So I got on, I got connected with Tom Heiser from a guy at Woodward actually when I was working at Woodward East. <clears throat> And uh, Tom liked my skating and was like, yes, do it. And so he let me ride for them early on. And I think I skated for them for a few years. And then I quit. And then when I started doing the urban skating years and years later, uh, they had just come out with the, eh, maybe the Metro Blade was out for like a year. But the Metro Blade was like, 
every time I would just see that Metro Blade, I was like, oh my God. And I think before that I was skating sub SXs, but the Metro Blade, like the sneaker look and just how simple it was, was really appealing to me. And I think I might've reached out to Tom and just been like, can I try out these skates? And he, I think at that point, just I, since I liked him, I think he was like, just skate breath. So it was an awesome time. I love Tom. He's, he's super supportive. He's understanding of whatever you're, what's going on in your life and whatever he's, he's a great guy. So I loved working with them. And then I got to work with kind of my hero, Sean Keen, and that was an amazing experience. And, you know, that he's still a good friend. And I, you know, the whole rollerblade experience has been super positive, you know, from day one. So that's what I was going to ask. Cause obviously you did the in motion series with, yeah, you mentioned Mike and it was in New York, New Orleans in San Francisco. So did you know, or had hung about with, or had any contact with either of those guys before going on those trips? Uh, I think, I can't remember if I had known Sean before that or not, before the first, the first one was in New York. I can't remember if I knew Sean before that, but I never met Mike. <clears throat> and I think I might've just messaged him on Instagram and said, we, you know, me and Tom Heiser have this project idea. Would you be interested in working with us? So, you know, he was, he was down to do it. And we went, to, we did New York first so that he didn't have to take time out of his schedule to travel and whatever. And obviously New York's an amazing place to do it. And so, we tested it there and we thought it was a success. So we did two more, but so you, yeah, you came up with the concept for in motion. Me and Tom did. Yeah. Okay. There was some freedom in like, you know, if you guys have ideas, if the team has ideas, let us know what your idea is. And, um, I think something lacking at the time was sort of the idea of experiencing a new place, like as a tourist kind of on skates and, you know, it's a pretty simple idea and we just wanted somebody that could like really show that off visually. And I think Torres did a great job. I'm really, I'm proud of those edits and it was such a cool experience because that was my first time in New York too. So to have him touring us around his, his city was just so perfect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The New York is one of those, actually all of them, it, it gives you it is quite cool and that it does give you an insight into the city as well as getting to see some yeah cool skating tricks or people looking good on skates and it's kind of surprising for how long that was missing in inline skating like it seemed like especially in the 90s it seemed like they went out of their way to make it look as stupid as possible <laughs> like it was just people being incredibly dramatic and really extra and really and even in the 2000s where everyone gravitated towards that gravitated away from that they didn't gravitate towards a kind of more stylish subdued simple minimalist just here's how graceful it look can look or how smooth it can look or you know yeah. how confidence it, it, it just kind of it, it was weird yeah. that it, it took so long for that to happen yeah. i think even in at the time in the modern urban skating world there wasn't even at that point like urban skating at that point was still pretty dramatic. I feel like, and a lot of the content was coming out of Europe and it was really fast paced still and yeah. very go, go, go. Yeah. They tried to was, make it kind of look like fast and furious on skates or something. It yeah. was that, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Like it, it didn't, that what, what yeah. replaced the cheese was not any better. And I think, I think, um, the, certainly I don't relate to that type of skating and I don't just go, go, go. And I don't like, you know, even music wise, I don't listen to that type of really fast paced stuff. So <clears throat> Torres was for sure, like, I'm just going to do it how I see it and what my vibe is and whatever. And I think that really showcases um, sort of the other half of, you know, people becoming interested in the sport. It's like, well, I don't want to go, go, go. I just want to chill and go get a coffee or whatever. And so I think it, he, he did it, I think three times really well. That was, it doesn't have to be like a pursuit. It, it can just be a, an experience and it can be as slow and fast as you want it to be. But, you know, our vibe is as like the three of us, Michonne and uh, Torres is definitely, you know, actually personally are more mellow people. And, and even when in San Francisco and um, 
uh, let's say I can't even think of his name again. Cameron Talbot. <laughs> Cameron, yeah, Talbot, yeah. Uh, when Talbot is definitely a super chill guy, so it's like, why not just show that off? And we got a little pushback from people and who didn't like that it was. It, we got a lot of it was too slow, you know. So oh, like in in the comments or what? Or yeah, and and other places, yeah, like you know, bigger heads that maybe a rollerblade or whatever were like not. It was just kind of like, are we sure this is the vibe or whatever? And, but right. you know, for us, we were like, yeah, that's definitely the vibe, <laughs> and we, it was a success. We had I got tons of feedback from strangers saying, "I want to get skates. This is so cool." I never even thought to go skating to get a coffee. You know, yeah. it's like people don't even, you know, they just think you go to a park and you exercise or whatever. And it's like you can just go do whatever you want. You just pretend yeah. you're a car or on a bicycle or whatever. So. Yeah. yeah use it to navigate yeah an urban space and unlike a yeah. bike you don't have to leave it outside you can literally take it into the office and shove them under your desk um what i wanted to ask about the new york one was it all filmed in a day from like nine o'clock in the morning until night or did mike use creative license and that was filmed over several days and he just made it appear like it was a 12-hour uh, experience Use creative license, but some of them might have been in the same day. And you, they might have fallen into the same day. <laughs> he's a liar. There might have been one or two that was like similar timing, but yeah, I think we were out there for four, four days or something. And I think uh, a lot, a big focus was also like social content and not just Mike's content. So we also skated and did a separate kind of social media thing. So okay. Mike, I know you're watching this because you watch all of them and you feedback regularly. You're a liar and I found you. Cinematic magic. I knew you lied. <laughs> um, that's quite funny. So, and how how long were like the New Orleans and the San Francisco ones filmed over? I think they're the same. It's about four or five days. I think I can't remember for sure, but yeah, probably no more than four or five days. So... Mm. What like what were what were some of the takeaways from these trips? Did anything interesting or weird or like the, what happened in on the various adventures? Because New York and San Francisco are both pretty kind of hectic places. I don't know what New Orleans is like. I've never been, but you know New York's kind of New York's a bit of a sensory overload. Yeah, I think that was the benefit of having Mike tour us around. Was he? maybe he avoided the crazy spots, but he navigated us. It was very like, honestly, New York was a really chill experience and it was really fun. And we hung out with some of his friends and uh, that was actually like, cause I was always nervous to go to New York without a host kind of, because I was afraid of that. I was afraid of something crazy happening or hectic or whatever, but he's, he can navigate it so easily and he gets it all. So that was super smooth. I'd say probably the, most hectic to me felt like um was new orleans because i never that is like so not my scene and you know i like to go have a beer and hang out and stuff but it's basically exactly what you and i are I doing right now i was about to say you're not like you're not into the whole kind of big woohoo yeah. screaming party uh and so ag do vibe he was like i think at some point he's like almost warned us like i'm sorry we're gonna have to go to the you know that main street in new orleans or whatever like we just need to get some footage or whatever because we might have just avoided it had we not needed the footage. Like we yeah. might have just went and experienced other parts. Because you know, probably typical skaters is kind of we like to go see stuff that's not the most common or whatever. So, but th and that wasn't even that bad. Like to be fair to New Orleans, it was actually pretty mellow. I'm sure it can get insane, but it was a good time and it was fun to actually we skated around with the beer on the street like legally, which I've probably never done in my life. So. Okay. That was a cool experience, but takeaways too, is just like being able to almost just like selfish fulfillment. It was just like being able to have an Airbnb with two of the most incredible skaters I know and, you know, call them friends now and, and get to watch them skate obstacles that they see, you know, like I've never gotten to skate with somebody like Mike, who's that like, he is so unbelievably creative, creative and talented at that blend of mushroom and aggressive that he's doing. And I think he skated the whole time on all three trips, I think, um, with Wizards, maybe five by somethings. Right. And 
I just respected skating so much. And so just selfishly, it was just so fun and like, so such a great experience for me. So, but yeah, I don't think anything stood out in terms of like, there was no wacky. I think if you get three mellow guys in a room, not that much can happen. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, ex- expecting some kind of, you know, dumb and dumber yeah. slapstick humor. I was just, I was just wondering if any interesting interactions happened because when you're in the streets and stuff like that, you tend to bump into a very vast array of characters and people who normally you wouldn't see in everyday life because you're hanging out in places that most people don't hang out in. There's definitely a guy in, I think, San Francisco that had already fallen before he approached us he was hammered and he had a huge gash on his face like blood everywhere and but he was wearing like a full suit you know like telling us like whatever he's telling us and then he i think he fell onto uh sean or he's about to fall into sean and he and i think sean got out of the way or whatever and he just ended up laying right in front of us just like super completely gone drunk out of his mind and i think we saw him the next day which is kind of their own, like just same, same dude sober now, just like trying to probably find his bus. Like that was a rough night, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey man, you, you, San Francisco. you doing good now? And he's like, who the hell are you? Why are you talking to me? <laughs> um, right. Okay. So yeah, the, like role-play things seem to work out quite well for you. You're getting skates that seemed like they were, you know, you were getting to do these projects. I'm, I'm assuming they were paying for like travel and accommodation while you were, away doing these things yeah. um so was that like were you were you getting paid by rollerblade or was it just like skates and trips yeah just trips and skates and just really like also sort of a promise of like experiences like tom was just so open to ideas and being able to go do stuff and then locally too they would come here for they they do like ski program stuff and they have a lot of initiative and the skate to ski program and so they would come to utah often and i would help them with projects here too so okay so what point did you decide that you were gonna leave rollerblade or you didn't want to do that anymore what did did you leave to join micro or had you already stopped skating for rollerblade before that um so the metro blade we mentioned before was i love i still love that skate that's such a good skate but um they discontinued it right and so i started skating the rb80 <clears throat> and i liked the rb80 but i wasn't like you know i went from something that i loved and i loved how responsive and quick it was and it, it felt you know like a ninja skate it was just like so quick and responsive for not a carbon fitted molded boot right but when they discontinued it, I was just really disappointed in that. Cause I think that that skate still has a lot to offer people. Um, and I kept skating the RB80 and I had a good time on that and it was fine, but I kept wanting the Metro blade and just at the, you know, at the same time of really wanting this Metro blade thing to happen and like wanting it to come back and hoping it would come back and whatever. Um, I started speaking to Ricardo and, and talking about micro and, you know, we were talking about carbon boot, a fitted boot that maybe would feel like a Metro blade in terms of responsiveness and fit. And it was kind of like, well, let's try out the carbon boot. Cause it was my first carbon boot I skated since the SX, the sub SX. Yeah. And when I got it and I heat molded it, it kind of just felt again, like I was excited again. It was like, this is, the right feeling i guess like this doesn't feel clunky in any way it's really responsive and that's kind of the main thing i desire in urban skating is something that's like really fast really light really responsive and like makes me feel like i'm not limited at all by the the products and just it's all me so you can't blame anything it's just like all me if i mess up or whatever right right and and uh so yeah i i quit i told tom i think i'm gonna just try this micro thing out i really like to skate a lot and we you know lino and i are working on other stuff and other skates that we kind of believe in in terms of urban skating and what i want to see and what he wants to see out of a urban product and so with that i just yeah i told heiser like thank you for everything this is amazing and 
I just got to move on and try, try this thing out, you know? Okay. So did, did you approach Ricardo or did he poach you? I just want to, what, mm, what get the facts? facts I think it was, I would say I approached him, but he was already wanting to talk to me, <laughs> but he was respectful to Heiser. He was really respectful. And I had found out through somebody else, um, that Lino was kind of like interested, but he wasn't reaching out. And so I did reach out and say, what are you interested in? What's the, what's going on? You know, cause I didn't know any, like most people no idea what micro was and wanted to hear what he had to say about it. So I would say he did not approach, but he probably wanted to. All right. Okay. So <laughs> what, what's the deal with micro? Cause you mentioned that it's kind of different from rollerblade and that I'm, I'm assuming you'll have some input in product development. Yeah, so we, yeah, that's kind of the big appeal is that I have ideas on products and some, a big, big company like Rollerblade can't really, you know, they have a, a direction that they've found out that's like their direction for the next three years or four years or whatever it is, right? And so a smaller company and somebody like Lino, they're really open to suggestions and they're open to ideas and, um, for my type of skating, I have a lot of ideas that like, uh, you know, that I think could help us skate out. And I think that them being so open to it was uh, appealing and then being able to, you know, being told, yeah, you can help with product design and with like development basically. So, yeah. I so think it's, is it just like a an outside of that is it like a is a different deal to rollerblade or like are you an employee or is it just like getting product what how does it how does it work um, i do i am sort of an employee for us market sort of marketing and like what what you know i'm just helping decide what's the approach to the us market i guess and um and then sort of ambassador and skate for them too and go do projects and films it's all the same stuff as rollerblade with just a little bit extra with just a little bit of like here's what do you think of the skate you know let's make a skate that works and yeah okay that's what i was going to ask do they have any like video projects coming up or anything where you're gonna yeah film for anything like how's that gonna work so i've gone on a couple trips for them that was kind of specifically for uh social media but I, w I went to San Francisco to film a project of, for a skate and the skate didn't get here before, before my flight. So it became a social media um, pr uh, trip again. Right. <clears throat> Lino and I have ideas of a few trips. Um, it sounds like flying out of Portugal is a lot harder than it is flying around America. Like I, I'm pretty much free to go anywhere in the States, but uh, he's been having a really hard time. I think he's on his first airplane right yeah, now. Yeah, so I saw he's, yeah. I saw he was just in Amsterdam recently. Yeah. yeah, Europe Europe is really it's just kind of opened up now like before it was all like they had these different levels and if you were going from one level to the other you would have to quarantine for 2 weeks or or some countries were just like no, you're not getting in and like right now I think right now it's pretty much impossible to get into the US from the UK without quarantining for two weeks? Because I know some people are trying wow. to get to Bladen Cup and they're having to visit, you know, like Mexico and then travel up or whatever. So, Oh, wow. Yeah, I think if if, the, if we didn't have to navigate um, travel with the pandemic and stuff, I think definitely we would have already been on a trip, I would say, for sure. We have plans to do it. It just pretty much it's just on hold until it can open up, until things are more easy to book you know but i definitely Lino and i want to meet up um we want to go to a couple of places i would like to go to china and, and kind of go to the factories and see what's going on there so nice who who else is sponsored by micro is there like an official team or anything or um they i i believe i'm the only u.s rider right but, but um there are people on the team and they're mostly Europe based. I know he has people in uh, South Africa too, I think. And then I think we have somebody in Africa that I think Sam is his name. We, uh, Lino is like kind of the, 
brand manager, team manager. And since there isn't a lot of people in, well, since there's nobody in the U S I'm not really like familiar with what's going on outside of it. Right. So I don't want to say like names or whatever in case I'm wrong, but there's definitely like a team I would say, but it's maybe not like an official, like this is what's going on. This is our, you know, like most companies. Yeah. But I think that will also change as things evolve. And I think, you know, the new products that we're working on could also alter that. And so in time, hopefully soon that will, that could change. You know? That's fair enough. Ricardo is a man of many ideas. In fact, I'm going to go as far as to say a limitless, never ending amount of ideas. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure he's got stuff up his sleeve and, you know, if he's, if he's other successes or anything to go by, I'm, I'm sure it's going to go well. Cause he, he knows how to make something out of nothing. I'll give him that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. Um, totally forgot to ask you this and like, I know we're swerving back, but I was kind of reminded when I, I rewatched your snake river section, the free skate part and in it, there's a few clips of, uh, Jeff Phillip and you guys are at the same spot. And I think he high fives you for doing a line where you end up like kicking a bush at the end or something, or you like fakey three over a bush and like, clip the top of it and it just kind of got me thinking about like when you go out skating as a free skater is it is it more difficult or like harder to hang about with you know your aggressive friends because perhaps they want to go and skate a ledge or they want to go and skate a handicap rail or they want to you know go and you're like well there's not really anything for me here or like there's not anything that excites me here it's just it's just this obstacle that you know, I stopped doing this because I find yeah. this a little bit mundane or whatever. Like, does it create that kind of, I don't know, distance between you guys where you're like, well, I want to skate with you and I want people to hang out with, but I also yeah. don't want to be limited to session in this rail for two hours because that's not my idea of a good time. You know, over the years, I've certainly ran into that where I've pretty much like left a session because I'm just like, you guys are going to keep skating the slot ledge, you know, or whatever it is. But <clears throat> early on, I was the only one doing urban skating period for a long time. Like even Cameron Carr or Carrillo, these guys would always just show up with their aggressive skates. And so early on, it was pretty difficult because, well, it was like difficult and it wasn't. It kind of, I think what sparked the creativity around the environment expanding, it was like, if they're going to skate this thing in the middle of this environment, then I have all this time to just float around it and figure out what else yeah. is there. Right. Yeah. And nowadays we actually have like sort of more full-time urban skaters in Salt Lake now. And, and so it's not as common, but I still find a lot of inspiration from aggressive skating. And I find, you know, a lot of my friends are really talented and they, I like their approach to urban or to aggressive skating. And so I think it drives, I think there's a little bit of a respect on both sides where I think they want, they think of me, they do think of me like when I, when we're picking spots and stuff sometimes. And they, and I think, and I try to do the same thing sometimes, but I think it not only helps my skating, but I think it also helps some of theirs. Like I can see a little bit of an urban flow. I feel like in some of Salt Lake's aggressive skaters where they're sort of, you know, and I'm not saying it's because of me, but I, you know, I see a little bit of similarities and maybe it's just coincidence, but I think, you know, at times, yeah, you, you sit around, sometimes I'll just film. I'm just like still just the filming and I go, this is this hammer Hazen's going to do and he's going to do it until he gets it. And I'm fine to sit there and film it and hang out. But, you know, so yeah, sometimes you run into times where it's, it's a little, lacking in the spot for me <laughs> yeah for, for urban skating yeah um but it is an interesting point you raise like no matter who you skate with you end up becoming influenced by by them whether it's if they're better than you or if there's just specific terrain like i don't know if you're a traditional street skater and you go to a skate park with someone and you see them skating a bowl and you're like oh you're like that's it you know you you start watching them closely and not like that's the line they're taking that's how they're getting so much speed round and they're like that's what i'm doing wrong or you know they're carving yeah. this particular way so you know it, it, it's you're probably right yeah they probably watch some of the movements you do on free skates and they're like i could 
I could replicate that, but use it, I don't know, to connect it to a trick or coming out of a trick or yeah. Or it's just super unconscious and they just like, it just like becomes some sort of flow inside of their, their own skating, you know? Yeah. And I think we all pull that, you know, like Albert who used to be like one of my favorite skaters ever and probably consciously I was like, I'm going to do something like this. Probably never did it, but I'm sure it, you know, unconsciously sort of decided some trick selection or whatever I was doing in the moment. For sure. You chose a tough one to emulate because he's like the ultimate rail tapper. So that, that's just asking to hit your nuts and your shins off every flat rail going. Because <laughs> he used to do those, he used to do those like round the world grinds where he'd start off yeah. and work his way all the way back round to the same grind, but yeah. with five in between. That's that, that that's just pain waiting to happen on the types <laughs> of obstacles he was doing it on. I just loved how I just loved his style. He was more like upright and i don't know there's a few people that like bj bernhardt i just love these guys that have like very very unique random kind of upright postures or something maybe it's because i'm like tall and slender and i feel out of place on skates at times but i just some of those guys i just like really loved growing up Um, that makes it yeah i think i think if you're above like five eight or whatever you just feel like yeah you, you just feel like I don't know, a giraffe on skates, basically. Because I remember as a teenager being jealous of short guys, you know, like, I don't know, Louis Zamora and stuff like that. Because when they did Royales and top size and stuff, they just always looked so much better because they had like the small limbs, not... They're just like a ball. Yeah, dangling everywhere. Yeah, (laughs) everything was just compact. And I was like, you know... How tall are you? uh, I'm like 5'11". So, and I'm lanky. So, and I've got a very long torso. So, yeah, I just look... yeah. I would say I look awkward on skates, but I've been doing it so long that it's not going to change now. Yeah, uh, right. yeah, it's just quite funny when you're in school and everyone's like, God, I wish I was like, wish I was like taller or like, I don't know, like more buff. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to be short. Like, I'm going to go on want small feet. I want, I want short. Feet short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you did mention, Mike mentioned it, I think it was in his Jump Street podcast that when he got into free skating, he got a lot of, like, not a lot of pushback, but just got clowned a little bit by his friends because he just started showing up at the sessions with, like, I don't know, the wizard frames or you mentioned, like, the five wheel, five wheel frames. And these friends are just like, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, you know, pirouetting in front of them. And they're like, just, just grind, the, grind the rail and stop being, <laughs> yeah. stop being a dick. You're like, what are yeah, yeah. you doing? <laughs> did you get any kind of pushback like that from from your group or were they like all right now that's cool um i think i think probably like teased but like super supportive right like yeah even still like i'll do something i like accidentally royaled like this much of a rail the other day and i was just stalling it and they were just like come on man he's got to get aggressive skates dude he's like, back he's off. back he's got a taste yeah, for it yeah. now that's it <laughs> so there's like friendly teasing and stuff but no one definitely no one locally it was like this is dumb, you know? So I probably, I mean, online, I definitely got a little bit of backlash and I still get it. You know, we still get people like just aggressive skate, man. Like that's not cool or whatever, but you're, you're not foolish enough to read the comment sections, are you? Cause some people <laughs> just do that for sport or out of sheer yeah, boredom. Yeah. No, I'll read some comments. I like to respond to like a uh, product, conversation you know like if like what skate is that or what frame is that or whatever so i try to read them to kind of find those comments but yeah often i'll see the bad ones but i don't mind it i get it fair enough (laughs) um so you've mentioned multiple products during this chat you talked about how you started free skating on the seba sx you love the metro blades you skate the rb80s and now you're on micro i know you've obviously got a current loyalty to micro skates but what's What's been your dream setup so far on free skates? Like which, cause you seem to be quite enamored with the Metro blades. Um, yeah, I was, I was like ready to just take on Metro blade as like a personal project if they would have let me. Uh, I think it was because it was linerless, but like not, not like a Seba SX or something. It's, it's way thinner and more minimal materials. And, and um, so my dream skate from experiencing the, Metro Blade was a carbon boot, but that was sl- more slender than an SX. Cause I feel like that still has a lot of material and a lot of ex- excess a little bit. Okay. And, and 
though currently I'm technically skating a slalom skate, the reason is because it's so compact and tight. And that's like the purpose of a slalom skate is you need something super fitted that's responsive and to be able to be on the toe and all that. And so I would say still today, the dream skate is a ultra fitted carbon boot, heat moldable, but like less materials than maybe some people are putting on their skate. All right. And uh, definitely endless frames. So you, you, you like For what sure. you want to see from a skate is like as stripped down as possible, like just what is needed and no more. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't, I don't, and maybe, you know, some companies probably think they need the stuff that's on it. But I think if you, you know, the Metro Blade was definitely the most minimal skate I had, I had ever skated at the time. And there was even two versions of it where one was kind of more minimal than the first round. And I think experiencing that just put in, you know, put into perspective, like you don't need much. Like if, if you can just design something on the inside that, you know, like you and I spoke about just fit, but something that the padding is in the right spot, but it can just be a little bit. And I think the intuition liner is a good representation of that. It's like the most minimal liner there is in terms of like bulk. Yeah. But it's the right materials that like allows for contact in the right places or protection in the right places. But everyone can downsize now because you don't have all this excess stuff. But then, but now some of the shells are like too big, right? It's like, so now you're putting this tiny thin liner into a big fat shell. So I think a balance of those are important for the right skate, at least for urban skating, you know, but like, I'm not looking for the same type of um, flex and stuff that an aggressive skater is looking for. Like I don't need side flex at all. I just need forward flex. You, you, and do if you, so, you do if you want to pull off those slides for for a long, a long time. Well, I can slide now, and I got you're, carbon you're, cuts. You need some, you need some flex. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like I don't need a royale, and I don't need a sedan and stuff. Yeah. So I think that you know I want to design something for me that's like super selfish. Like I just want to design like a product that's specifically for me, and then see what other people think. You know. I, that's like kind of would be like my dream skate was something that's just like the bare bones simplest thing and yeah see how how it feels interesting story about the metro blades i don't know if you know this but uh rollerblade tried to hire peter from adapt to design skates and like products for them and i think he even flew to wherever they're based in Europe to have a meeting with him and just wasn't really kind of happy with the, like what he was offered. And then they were buying like adapt products off him. And he thought that's a bit strange, like someone from rollerblades just buying these products. And mm. then they released the Metro blade and Peter's convinced that they basically just stole elements off the adapt skate and, <laughs> and used it to make, make, make the Metro blade. So I don't yeah. know how much of that's true, but that's, that's the impression he's come under with his, with his experience for the brand. <laughs> I haven't heard that. No, I haven't heard that. It's too bad that he feels like they stole it. Cause I think, you know, evolving a product into something else is important, but I think getting, getting ideas from good products. Like if, if Rollerblade did that, they're proving that he has a good product. Yeah. They're proving he has a good design. And I think he should be proud of that. Um, I definitely, I've never skated a, a, a adapt skate. So I don't know if it feels in any sort of similar, but I definitely, the, Metro Blade is more boxy than a adapt. So at least he has a slimmer feel, slimmer look. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got no idea. I've never skated. The Metro Blades always appealed to me, but I've never, yeah, I haven't had a chance to try them. And yeah, now, by cool. the sounds of things, I won't. So I'm sure you can get them used. I definitely look around and try to find a used pair and try them out. They're, they're interesting for sure. They're pretty unique. Yeah. All right. Um, I've taken up a lot of your time this evening here and this afternoon there. So I'll, I'll let you get back to business. But last question, what is, what is the immediate future hold or what is the, what is the, you know, the next, the next six months to a year looking like for you? Like what are your, what are your plans? Obviously you're going to be incredibly busy with this new business venture. Yeah. I mean, I'll be incredibly busy with it all photo shoots and everything. I think uh, a big, you know, the number one is just going to be 
really trying to be a part of the community and, and being involved with these events that are happening. There's a lot of roller skate events happening that are, we're currently not a part of, but that we know about. There's currently a lot of derby events happening that we know about, but aren't a part of. And we're sort of invited, I think. So we want to take that on and, and, and really build relationships over the winter. And it's a good time, I think, in, you know, a cold climate to get involved personally with people and just, and make good relationships. So that's sort of my big approach. And I, I think, you know, with the shop, getting products, branded beehive and trying to push those out will be important. I think it will also be cool and unique to, for locals and stuff. So, um, and then really just aiming for springtime to just be like as busy as possible. So. Awesome. Well, the goal. sounds like you've got, yeah, loads of plans ahead of you and I hope things go well with the shop, but look, it sounds like you guys have got a solid plan in place that you want to action. So I don't know how the hell you're going to juggle it all with, with a job and a family, but you know, if figure it out, yeah, if you're, <laughs> if you can figure it out, then more power to you. Um, yeah. Thanks for taking the time to do this today. It's been an absolute pleasure and wish you all the best. I just hope that all this other work you're doing doesn't mean that we're going to see less skate footage from you because it's, it's a lot to juggle. Yeah, no, well, I'll definitely get out skating. I got to keep, it's like my only exercise that's so got to happen. Right, okay. Like, <laughs> that, that can be the argument that you tell to your partner. You can be like, you don't, you don't want me to get fat, do you? Yeah. You don't, you don't I don't do anything fat. else physically, so let's just let me go skate. <laughs> right. All right, man. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Anytime. Hopefully speak soon. Okay, see ya. Bye. Bye.